The world breaks everyone, and afterwards many are strong at the broken places. That's Ernest Hemingway from A Farewell to Arms. I'm Ron Thomas, and in this program we're going to talk about sentence construction and diagramming. One of the things that Hemingway knew, and Mark Twain and other notable writers, was that brevity was key to good sentences. Both of them had been trained as newspaper men, so they learned to write with economy of verbiage, which is probably why many of their quotes make it into these books of great American quotations and such as that. But it's a skill that you can learn, and that's what we're going to do with today's program. We're going to teach you how to construct a sentence with economy and with power. We'll be using some tools today. I'll be working with a document camera to show you the process of constructing a sentence, and I'll also be looking at a monitor so that we can see exactly how the sentence is being built. In any good sentence, you must have at least two minimum parts. It requires a noun and a verb. So even nondescript words such as person and is are sufficient for us to build a sentence. There's at least the noun, the person, and there is a verb, is. Now, neither of these are very strong words. Neither of them are very descriptive, but they form the core of building a sentence. We have a noun and a verb. In technical terms, we call that a subject and a predicate. And those are terms that we'll be using as we build our sentence. But clearly, a sentence that is person is is not going to be very exciting writing. So let's see what we can do to improve that by building out from the core to construct a better sentence. First, we'll change the verb and make it more specific. So now we have person waited. Waiting indicates anticipation, not just existence, as the verb is would do. The choices that we make about the verb and the noun that we use in the sentence drive where everything else goes. So if you're going to spend time in building your sentence, start with the verb or the noun and the verb, the subject and the predicate, because from here is where the power of the sentence comes. In English grammar, we use these small words called articles, a or the, to create grammatical structure, to make our sentences proper. But even that simple choice is huge. If we say a person waited, this could be a background character. This is no particular person. But if we say the person waited, now we've made it special. We've indicated that this is a particular person of interest. So even your small choice between a and the is important. But if we change the noun and make it specific, and now we make it the man waited, We've already eliminated half of the population. By sex, we have separated the man from all of the females who might be the subject of our story. But even man is kind of a neutral word. So let's take that a step further. Now we choose the noun father. We've said something very specific about this man. We know that he has a relationship with at least one child. So, by choosing the correct noun, I have said more about the man who is in my sentence than merely indicating his presence. I've said something about his relationships. Now, when we talk about nouns and verbs, that's where our strength comes from. But we can add to that with modifiers. We've talked about parts of speech elsewhere on this website. So, if we add the adjective expectant, We've modified the word father. What's an expectant father waiting for? Our connotation, which is a term you're familiar with elsewhere on this website, is that the father is waiting for a baby. So now we're starting to create a, a real story here. We have an expectant father. So it might be a father who is waiting for the first child. So this sense of expectation now modifies our father and puts him in a frame of mind in a mood. To be more explicit about that frame of mind, we can say that he's a nervous expectant father. 
in our case here, both nervous and expectant are adjectives working to modify father. So all of these are now part of the subject of the sentence because our subject is now built from the root noun father, the two adjectives, nervous and expectant, and the article the indicating that we're speaking about a particular father. As we continue, our nervous expectant father is now waiting impatiently. Here's a key that you probably remember from middle school grammar. Words that end in L-Y are typically adverbs, which means, you see the word verb here, they modify verbs. It tells us how the father is waiting, okay? So the adverb modifies the verb waited and indicates that he is waiting impatiently. Impatiently and nervous are two separate conditions. A person can be nervous without being impatient. So we choose both of these words in order to indicate the total mood of our father and how he is waiting. Let's go a step further. The nervous expectant father waited impatiently, pacing like a soldier on guard duty. Notice now our, we have a comma in this location and the period is at the end. Our sentence here, we have a father and waited, subject and a verb, subject and a predicate, but in this clause that comes after the comma, we only have another verb pacing, no additional subject. That makes everything here a dependent clause. It cannot operate as a sentence without being attached to the main part of the sentence that we have written previously. So pacing like a soldier on guard duty is an incomplete sentence. But if it's hooked with a comma to the main sentence up here, it functions together to build us a richer sentence. So now we not only have the father waiting, we have additional information about other actions that he is doing. If you see the word here, like, that's an indicator that we're using a special type of metaphor called a simile. So we are comparing this father to a soldier, and the word like actually connects them to indicate that our father is in a condition like a soldier. But for my way of writing, and probably for Hemingway and Twain, the phrase like a soldier on guard duty is kind of cumbersome. We're using more words than we need to. And a soldier on guard duty is referred to as a sentry. So again, just like choosing father as a stronger noun gave us a more specific condition about that man, choosing the word sentry instead of the phrase like a soldier on guard duty allows us to write shorter but still be very explicit in our description. So now we can have an entire scene happening in one sentence of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words. And we have built a very large and full sentence that contains action and very specific description. So by working out from the subject and the predicate, we can add these other modifying parts and build a very strong sentence that does not take up very many words. In this way, when you're trying to write a short essay or you're trying to write the essay answer to a question on an examination, you can say a lot of information in a very small space. In classic diagramming, we would see the sentence constructed like this. The father and all the parts here that are also in blue are the subject. The is an article attached to father, nervous and expectant are adjectives attached to father that modify and give us more information about the subject half of the sentence. Then this little dividing line is our way of diagramming where the predicate part happens, the verb phrase that puts action in the sentence. So modifying the verb waited, we have the adverb, see the L-Y again, for impatiently, 
And then notice how the second verb, pacing, we diagram that as a connector. Not only does it modify weighted, but it allows us to link to this metaphor like a sentry. So in, a, in diagramming, in classical English construction, we can see how half the sentence describes the action and half the sentence describes the doer of the action. So by using these tools of sentence construction and sentence diagramming, you'll be able to build powerful sentences that express a lot of meaning in a very short space. Thank you for your attention.